never saw a man meet death with finer courage. Don't let her stay in there too long. Mary, won't he? Ach, the darling. To think of him getting delighted that for his birthday. He'll be the happiest boy in all Brooklyn till he falls off of it.
That's a good time for you. Give us a little ride, will you, bub? I'm sorry, no. Oh, scared I'll get it dirty? No, but I'd rather ride it myself. Oh, 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 oh. Hey, English, when'd you get back from dear old London? I'm not English. I'm an American. Now, where'd you get that kind of gab? My father was English with any of your affairs. Oh, does your mother know you're out? Don't you dare talk about my mother. Mama said, Mama said, Mama said. <laughs> I think you'd better take your hand off that wheel. You want to make anything out of it? I want to make you get out of the way. Oh. <laughs> you don't dance, you sissy cat. Sissy cat! Wait a minute, Betty. Don't let him bluff you. I'll be right there. Pleasure, Freddy, my lad. Of course, I think we might as well anyway. Sure, and don't I know it? But I have to keep you from committing murder. I tell you what, Dick. I'll just go once around the block, and then you can ride it down to Mr. Hobbs' store. Make it later, because right away I gotta go see my brother Ben off. He's going out west. Who is he? Where? Texas? No, Chicago. Well, that would be splendid, riding Mustangs and shooting there. Here's my brother Ben now. Come on, Dick. I've got to leave. Well, come on down to the store as quickly as you can. What do you say to a little birthday party? Ginger pop and cookies and some candy. That would be perfect, Mr. Hobbs. Only, um... Only? Well, uh, Dick's coming very soon. And I was thinking, uh, if we could wait. I guess there'll be enough to go around. There's a lump coming, I think. Quite a big one. What are you reading, Mr. Hobbs? Ah, uh, that's the way they go on now. British aristocracy. I've got no use for them. Earls and Marcuses going around as if they was lords of creation, wearing their coronets. Did you ever know any Marquises, Mr. Hobbs, or Earls? I should say not. I'd just like to catch one of them inside here, that's all. I'll have no grasping tyrants sitting around on my cracker barrels. Perhaps they wouldn't be old if they knew any better. Oh, wouldn't they, though? They just glory in it. It's in them. They're a bad lot. Here you are, Dick. Just in time for Seti's birthday feast. Gee, Manetti, ginger pop and everything. Here's to your health, Betty. Many happy birthdays. Thank you very much, Mr. Hobbs. Why, Mary! Come on, home, darling. The mistress is wanting it. Oh, glory be. Would you look at your face? I'm very sorry, Mr. Hobbs, but I shan't be able to stay for the feast. Is there anything wrong with Kira? Uh, not at all, so there's nothing the matter with her. What's happened, Mary? Now, don't be asking me any questions. Where strange things happen at good. If you'll forgive me, Mrs. Errol, you must not disregard the great position to which your son has fallen heir through the death of his uncle, your late husband's brother. 
But what it amounts to, Mr. Havisham, is that you want to take my boy away from me. Mrs. Errol, you must remember that I'm acting quite impersonally and simply as a lawyer of the Earl of Dorincourt. The Earl of Dorincourt disowned his son and has refused to recognize his grandson until now. Why should I give up my boy? Oh, I'm afraid I've been very stupid, Mrs. Errol. I should have told you, my instructions are that you shall accompany Lord Fauntleroy to England. Oh. Now, I must remind you that Lord Dorincourt is not very friendly to him. He's an old man and has always had very strong prejudices against America and Americans, and was bitterly opposed to his son's marriage. He's fixed in his determination not to see you. You live at the lodge, and a suitable income will be provided for you. The only stipulation is that you make no attempt to visit your son at the castle, nor even enter the park gate. There's your sister, Mary. Hello, Bridget. Why, what's the matter? Mrs. Michael, his mercy is no money and we can't pay the rent. I don't know what I'm going to do. Now, Bridget, I've more important things to attend to. I wonder what your husband's wishes would have been in this matter. You, you knew my husband? Yes, I knew Captain Arrow well and liked him. As everybody did. He was greatly attached to his old home. Yes, I know. He, above everyone, would have appreciated what this means to your son. The very great advantages you have. Yes. You're right. My husband would have wished it. Mr. Havisham. I must ask you to let me tell Freddie about this in my own way and in my own time. He must never know his grandfather dislikes me. If he did, it would make it harder for them to be friends. Very well. Your son will thank you for this. I hope his grandfather would love Freddie. He has a very affectionate nature and has always been loved. Your grandfather has sent to see us, all the way from England. How do you do, sir? So this is little Lord Fauntleroy. You see, dear, your grandfather has no more children now, and he's very lonely. So he wants us to go and live with him in England. Because he's an earl, and you are his heir. You will have a new name, Lord Fauntleroy. And someday you will be the Earl of Dorincourt. Oh, dearest, do I have to be an earl? None of the boys are earls. Can't I not be one? I'm afraid it can't be healthier. Just think, dear. Soon we'll be starting for England. Do we have to go to England, dearest? I'd much rather not. Oh. What will Mr. Hobbs say? Anything else, ma'am? Uh, how much is your table butter? Thirteen cents a pound, ma'am. Thirteen? Why, the last I bought was only twelve and a half cents. That must have been last month. It's thirteen today. Oh, indeed. Well, never mind the butter. Heavens and earth, if prices go any higher, we'll all starve to death. Good day. Good day, ma'am. Hello, Seti. What's the matter? Mr. Hobbs, do you remember what we were talking about yesterday morning? Seems to me we was talking about England. Yes, yes, and Earl, don't you remember? Oh, yes. We did touch him up a little. That's all. You said you wouldn't have him sitting around on your cracker barrel. So I did. And I meant it, too. Just let him try it, that's all. Mr. Hobbs, one is sitting on this barrel now. What? Yes, I am one. Or I'm going to be. I won't deceive you, Mr. Hobbs. It's the heat. It is a hot day. 
How do you feel? Got any pain? Thank you, I'm all right. I'm sorry to say it's true, Mr. Hobbs. Mr. Haversham, he's a lawyer, came all the way from England to tell us about it. My grandfather sent him. Who is your grandfather? I couldn't very easily remember it, so I wrote it down. John Arthur Mullinux Errol, Earl of Darincourt. That's his name, and he lives in the castle. There are two or three castles, I think. All his sons have died now. That's why I shall be an Earl. Now I'm Lord Fauntleroy. Well, I'll be cheated. One of us has got a sunstroke. Oh, no, we haven't. We have to make the best of it, Mr. Hobbs. What did you say your name was? Frederick Errol, Lord Fauntleroy. Well, I am jiggered. Well, you always did talk more English than American. I think there's no getting out of it? I'm afraid not, Mr. Hobbs. Dearest says that father would wish me to do it. But if I have to be an earl, I can try to be a good one. I'm not going to be a tyrant, Mr. Hobbs. And if there's ever to be another war with America, I shall try and stop it. England's a long way off, isn't it? To cross the Atlantic Ocean. That's the worst of it. Perhaps I shan't see you for a long time. I don't like to think about that, Mr. Hobbs. Well, the best of friends must part. I'm afraid, Mr. Havisham, our American food must seem very strange to you. A little, ma'am. I find that muffins are biscuits and biscuits are cookies. <laughs> but the cooking's excellent. And after all, it's the company that makes a meal exquisite, not food. Thank you, Mr. Havisham. When you're an earl, you'll give splendid dinners. One of the most beautiful castles in England. You know, I'm not sure I know exactly what an earl is. I think if anybody's going to be one, he ought to know, don't you? Would you mind explaining it to me? Well, someone is made an earl generally because he's done some service to his sovereign or some great deed. Oh, that's like the president. Oh, is it? Is that why your presidents are elected? Yes, sir. When a man is very good and knows a great deal, he's elected president. And they have talks like professions, with bands, and everybody makes speeches. I used to think perhaps I might like to be president. And I never thought of being an earl. No, being an earl is rather different from being a person. An earl is generally of very ancient lineage. Uh, what's that? Very old family. Extremely old. Oh, that's like the apple woman. She's a hundred, I should think. She's of such ancient lineage, it is surprising how she can stand up. I just feel sorry for anyone who's so poor and has such ancient lineage. She says hers has gone into her bones and the rain makes it worse. <laughs> when I said ancient lineage, I didn't mean old age. The first Earl of Dolancourt was created an Earl hundreds of years ago. Well, well, that was a long time ago, wasn't it, Earl? Yes, dear. Many Earls have been very brave men <laughs> and have fought in great battles. I should like to do that myself. My father was a soldier and a very brave man, as brave as George Washington. I'm glad Earl's are brave. That's a great bounty. Would you excuse me a moment, please? There's someone I must see. <laughs> there, um, there's another advantage of being an Earl. Some of them have a great deal of money. That's a good thing to have. I wish I had a great deal of money. Do you? Why? Well, there's so many things a person can do with money. If I were very rich, I'd buy the apple woman a little tent to put her stall in, and a stove. And I'd give her a shawl, because then her bones wouldn't feel so badly. Hmm. And uh, what else would you do, if you were rich? I'd buy dearest all sorts of beautiful things. Dearest? I call mother dearest, because father did. And it was Dick. And who's Dick? Dick the bootleg. I'd buy him some new cloths, some brushes, 
and a new sign and start him out fair. He says that's all he wants, is to start out fair. Hmm. Is there anything else? Well, I think Mr. Hobbs would like a gold watch and chain. But what would you get just for yourself if you were rich? Isn't there one particular thing you've dreamed of having? Yes. Pony. But I suppose that would be too much to even dream about. I'm so sorry. A poor woman who's in trouble came to see me. Oh, is it Bridget? Yes, dear. I wish we could do something for her. She has six children and her husband is out of work. He has inflammatory rheumatism and that's the kind of rheumatism that's dreadful. Before I left Court Castle, the Earl said that if you expressed any wishes, I was to gratify them. And give you anything you desire. Now, here, here are five pounds, and your money, twenty-five dollars. If you have any desire to assist this poor woman, I'm sure your grandfather would wish it. Can I have it now? Can I give it to her this minute? May I be excused, please, dear? Yes, Debbie. Bridget! Bridget! That's a great deal of money, Mr. Havisham. We've never had very much. I'm just beginning to realize the great power that he will have. Such a child still. I'm a little afraid. I think from what I've seen of him, that you have nothing to fear. Oh, I hope not. He mustn't be spoiled by all these wonderful changes. She cried. She said she was crying for joy. I never saw anyone cry for joy before. My grandfather must be a very good man. It's more, more agreeable being an earl than I thought it was going to be. In fact, I'm almost quite glad I'm going to be one. <sighs> be good. Gee, if trade gets any better, I'll be rolling around in diamonds and coils. That would be splendid, wouldn't it? I hope you have every sort of luck and happiness. Thanks, same to you, Emma. I hope you think about us sometime when you're way over there, they say, on foreign sorrow. 
I'll think about you all the time. And I'll write to you. You must write to me. Here's where you send your letter. Gee, I, I wish you wasn't going away. Thanks, mister, for all the swell things you've done for him. Frightened he destroyed me, the game little kid. Gee, I almost forgot. Yeah, I bought this for you. It's a handkerchief. You can use it when you get among them swells. Oh, Dick, it's beautiful. It's, uh, it's, it's extraordinary. I'll use it always. Thank you, Dick. Thank you very much. Well, goodbye. Well, goodbye. Would you mind very much not going in with me? I think this time I'd better be alone. Certainly, I quite understand. This is for you, Mr. Hobbs. That's just what I wanted for a long time. This is my real present, Mr. Hobbs. There's something written on it. Inside the case, I told the man what to say. You read it. From his oldest friend, Lord Fauntleroy, to Mr. Hobbs. In this, you see, remember me. Don't you go and forget me when you go over there amongst those British aristocracy. I shouldn't forget you, whoever I was among. I hope you'll come to see me. Perhaps my grandfather will write and invite you. You, you wouldn't mind him being an earl, would you? I mean, uh, you wouldn't stay away just because he was one. Oh, I'll come and see you. No, this is Court Lodge, where you're... Here's Mary. We had a splendid time in London, Mary. <laughs> I'm so glad you came before us, Mary. We don't feel so strange finding you here to welcome us. Oh, it is a great happiness. I wish you, Mum, in your lovely new home. 
This is Mrs. Baines, the cook, Mum. And that's Susan, the parlour maid. I'm sure we'll do everything, ma'am, to make you comfortable. Oh, I'm sure you will. I must say goodbye. The carriage is waiting to take me to the castle. I must tell the Earl of your safe arrival. You needn't go tonight. I'd so like to have him with me my first night here. No, I'm sure Lord Dorincourt won't expect his grandson tonight. Tomorrow will be time enough. I dread to tell him that we're not going to live together anymore. I'm a coward, I know. Putting it off so long. The most difficult and most cruel thing I've ever had to do. I wish you'd tell his lordship, please, but I'd rather not have the money. You mean the income he wishes to set on? I have a little money of my own, quite enough to live simply on. I must accept the house, of course, because that makes it possible for me to be near steady. I'm grateful to him for that. Okay? He'd be very angry. He won't understand it at all. I think he will understand. He must understand that I can't accept money from a man who hates me so much that he's separating me from my boy. I'll deliver your message. Something I must tell you. You're not going to understand it, I know. But I want you to believe me as you always have when I tell you it's for the best. Tomorrow, Mr. Havisham will take you to your grandfather. And you will live with him at the castle. But I shall not go with you. This pretty house will be my home, and Mary will be here to look after me. But, dearest. You don't mean... You can't mean that we're not going to be together, just as we've always been. Oh, no. I can't. I couldn't. I won't. I won't. Steady. <laughs> Steady. You must be brave and sensible. If there are some things you can't understand now, you'll understand them later. It's best for you to live there. There are good reasons why it is. You mean you want me to go away from you? No, of course not, darling. But now you're growing older, and we must trust, help one another without asking any questions. You know, Teddy, your grandfather loves you. He wants you to love him. He's so kind, he, he wants you to be happy and to make other people happy. Dear, I can't be happy without you. But you won't be without me all the time. I'm not far from the castle here. You'll run in and see me every day. You'll love the castle. There'll always be something new and interesting to tell me. And I'll have things to tell you. Oh, Daddy, we'll have such good times together. We'll be finding things out, both of us. We'll be exploring. Yes. Like, like Mr. Stanley and Mr. Livingston. That'll be exciting. And every night, when it grows dark, I'll put a candle in the window to guide you through the jungle, Mr. Stanley.
Ah, oh, Newick. How's his lordship? Oh, he's in this evening, he is. He told me to evict all the tenants if they weren't paid up. Oh, I dare say that'll be a job to your liking. Oh, sir. Ah, Purvis. Glad to see you again. I'm very glad to see you. Oh, idiot! Don't watch your hold! Say what was! No. Oh, yes, sir. These last few weeks have been the worst I've ever known, sir. I'm surrounded by a lot of incompetent people. Shut the door, you blockhead! I can't stand it no longer, Mr. Burris. It's too much for any man. Cursing and swearing and calling people out the names like he does. And it ain't just today, it's every day. Thomas, you brought in the 63 form, the first the 51. Oh, was I to know he didn't say? That's not a bottle. What business he got to leave for that way? I can't feed the house every day, he's out in the pants, and I won't. You and your poor, I've had enough of them. But, Miss Lord, Mr. Morton, you didn't, sir. I said all I had to say, and now I say good night. Oh, good day, my lord. Oh, good day. Oh, good day. Oh, good day. How'd you do, Mr. Havisham? Mr. Morton. Mr. Havisham, my lord. Well, Harrison. What? Come back, Harry. Put that cushion right for me, will you? Hey, 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 careful! Uh, uh. What's full of hot needles? Well, what have you got to tell me? For Contra and his mother are at Court Lodge. They bore the voyage excellent, eh? And in good health. Ah. What else? Because she remains with his mother tonight. I'll bring him to the castle tomorrow. Oh, go on, go on. Tell me everything. What sort of a lad is he? Never mind about the mother. What sort of a lad is he, I said. It's rather difficult to judge the character of a child of nine. Four, oh, huh? Clumsy cub. I don't know much about children, but I thought him rather fine lad. Healthy, well grown, eh? Apparently healthy, quite well grown. Straight limbed, well enough to look at. Rather handsome, my lord, as boys go. Ah. Huh. Although I, I'm scarcely a judge. I dare say you'll find him a little different from most English children. Oh, no doubt of that. American children are the most impudent and worst brought up in the world. I've heard that often. In his case, I would hardly call it impudent. The difference is, I think, that he's lived more with older people than with children. But I should call it a mixture of maturity and childishness. Exactly. Fixedly impudent, bad mannered. That's what it is. I, uh... I have a message to deliver from Mrs. Errol. I want none of her messages. The less I hear of her, the better. Ah, but this is rather an important one. She prefers not to accept the income you propose to settle on her. What's that? What do you say? She says it's not necessary. That the relations between you are not, uh, not friendly. Not friendly? I should say they were not friendly. Mercenary, sharp-voiced American. Lord, you could hardly call her mercenary. She's asked for nothing. Ah, oh, all done for effect. She thinks she can wheedle me into seeing her. Thinks I should admire her spirit, but I don't. She shall have the money sent to her whether she likes it or not. She won't spend it. I don't care whether she spends it. She shall have it sent to her. She shan't tell people that she's got to live as a pauper because I'm doing nothing for her. Oh. I suppose she's poisoning the boy's mind against me, too. No. I have another message that will prove to you she's not done that. I won't care. Oh. Ah. Oh. She asks you not to let Lord Fontoroy hear anything that might lead him to understand that you're separating him from her because of your prejudice against him. She says he wouldn't comprehend it. That it might make him fear you in some measure, or at least cause him to feel less affection for you. She wants there to be no shadow. On your first come now, Havisham, come now. You don't mean the mother hasn't told him? Not a word, my lord. Nothing has been said to the boy to give him the slightest doubt of your perfection. He's prepared to believe you the most amiable and affectionate of grandparents. In fact, he already regards you as a wonder of generosity. Ah. He does, huh? 
I would suggest, my lord, that Fauntleroy's impression of you depend entirely upon yourself. I make a further suggestion, that you'll succeed better with him if you take care not to speak slightingly to him and his mother. Boy, you nine. Nevertheless, those nine years have been spent at his mother's side. She had all his affection. Hmm. So, Lordship anywhere, sir. Yes, the cat's in safe and way. Oh, what is you who sent the cat? I'm never so much obliged to you, ma'am. How do you do? It is a great day, is it, sir? Where's his lordship? In the library, sir. Lord Fontroy is to be sent to him alone. Are you the Earl? I'm your grandson that Mr. Heavington brought. I'm Lord Fauntleroy. I hope you are quite well. I'm very glad to see you. Ah, glad to see me, are you? Yes, very. I kept wondering what you would look like, if you'd be anything like my father. Oh, and am I? Well, I don't think you are, very. You're disappointed, I suppose. Oh, no. Of course you would enjoy the way your grandfather looked, even if he wasn't like your father. You know how it is yourself about admiring your relations. Eh? I'm not sure that I do. Oh, any boy would love his grandfather, especially one who's been as kind to him as you've been. Oh, so I've been kind to you, have I? Yes. I never so much obliged to you about Bridget and the Apple Woman and Dick. Bridget? Dick? Apple Woman? They were particular friends of mine. You know, they were the ones you gave me all that money for. The money you told Mr. Heffington to give me if I wanted it. Oh, the money you were to spend as you liked, eh? So you spent it all on these people, did you? Bridget, Dick and the Apple Woman. Yes, and I gave Mr. Hobbs the gold watch and chain and the pipe. I put some poetry in the watch. It was, when this you see, remember me. I'm going to miss Mr. Hobbs very much. Who is Mr. Hobbs? He was our grocer. Fancy vegetables and groceries, you know. He's my closest friend. 
Mr. Hobbs is a very clever man. Do you know he can recite the Declaration of Independence right through? Oh. What's the matter? I just remembered you might not like to hear about the Declaration of Independence. I forgot you were an Englishman. Huh? I forgot you were English too, didn't you? Oh, no. I'm an American. You are English. Your father was an Englishman. I was born in America. You have to be an American if you're born in America. You oh, don't... I beg your pardon for contradicting you. Mr. Hobbs says that if there's ever to be another war, that I should have to be an American. But I promised him that if there were to be another war, I should try to stop it. You would, would you? <laughs> Uh, now be careful, man. Be careful. Careful, man, careful. Oh. Oh. Would you like me to help you? You can lean on me, you know. Once when Mr. Hobbs had his foot with the potato barrel falling on it, he used to lean on me. You think you could do it? I think I could. I'm very strong. I'm nine, you know. You lean on your stick on one side and on me on the other. Well, you must try. Just lean on me. I'll walk very slowly. Don't be afraid of leaning on me. I'm all right. If it isn't a very long way. You see that old fellow in red velvet? He was the 10th Earl of Doric Court. King George I decorated him for services during the war with Spain and Austria. He was tremendously strong. He could bend a bar of iron between his hands. You get your strength from him. Oh, how very interesting. Did you ever try putting your foot in hot water and mustard? Mr. Hobbs used to. Arnica is a very good thing, too, they tell me. Oh, thank you. I'll try it. What's the matter? Don't you like your soup? Oh, yes. I was just wondering. Wondering? Wondering what? You don't wear your coronet all the time, then? No, no. It, uh, it doesn't become me. Miss Hobbs said you wore it all the time. But after he thought it over, he said he thought you must take it off sometimes to put your hat on. I, uh, I take it off occasionally. Eh? You must be very proud of your house. I never saw anything so beautiful. But it's a very big house for just two people to live in, isn't it? Oh, you think it's too large? Well, I was only thinking. People lived in it who are not very good companions, they might get a little lonely sometimes. Thank you. You think I shall make a good companion? Yes, I think you will. I think you should be almost as interesting as Mr. Hobbs. Oh. Mr. Hobbs and I were very great friends. He was the best friend I had, except. Wonderai, what are you thinking of? Who is dearest? She is my mother. I... I think... 
think I'd better get up and walk up and down. He's a very nice dog. He's my friend. He knows how I feel. How do you feel? I suppose you think you're very fond of her. Yes, I do think so, and it's true. Mr. Hunt and the others were my friends. The dearest was my close friend. My father left her to me to take care of. When I'm a man, I'm going to work and earn money for her. Oh, what do you think of doing? Well, I did think of going into business with Mr. Hobbs. I should like to be president. We'll send you to the House of Lords instead. Well, if I couldn't be president, and if that's a good business, I shouldn't mind. The grocery business is dull sometimes. Yes, yeah, the House of Lords. But it's the business that every Earl of Darling Court goes into. I should have to talk to Dearest about it. Good morning, sir. Is the Lord Chief? In the library, sir. And such goings on I never heard in all my life. Do you think it'd be all right for me to see him? Oh, yes, sir. He's expecting it. Morden. Find a new employment, you see. Any good at marbles, Morden? My muscles are a little stiff with all, but I'll see what I can do. Oh, pity about that. I'd forgotten about your age. <laughs> oh. This is the new Lord Fauntleroy. Fauntleroy, this is Mr. Morden, rector of the parish. I'm very glad to make your acquaintance, sir. I'm delighted to make your acquaintance, Lord Fauntleroy. Well, what is it this morning, Father? Who's in trouble now? It's one of your tenants, sir. Higgins, the bench farm. Lewis has told him that if he doesn't pay the rent, he must leave the place. A bad tenant. Always behind, you, he tells me. He's devoted to his wife and children. If the farm is taken from him, they may literally starve. That's like Michael. Oh, I forgot we had a philanthropist here. Come here. What would you do in this case? Well, if I were very rich, I should let him stay and give him things for his children. Nonsense. You're Lord Fauntleroy. Time you learn to deal with these situations. You 
All right, can't you? Uh, yes, but not very well. Well, go over to the desk and write Newick his orders. Now, what must I say? You must say... Higgins is not to be interfered with for the present. Signed it, Fonderoy. Do you think it will do? Yes. Higgins will find it entirely satisfactory. Mr. Hobbs always signs his letters that way, and I thought I'd better say please. Is that exactly the right way to spell interfered? Well, it's not exactly the way it's spelled in the dictionary, but... I was afraid of that. No, Higgins won't complain of the spelling. I think you must be the best person in the whole world. Don't you, Mr. Mordrum? I shall write and tell Mr. Hobbs. Oh, uh, what will you tell him? I shall tell him I think you're the kindest man I ever heard of. And that you're always thinking of other people and making them happy. And that I hope when I grow up, I shall be just like you. Just like me. Hey, I'm Morton. Take that with you. I will indeed. This is good news. Thank you, my lord. Oh, don't thank me. Thank Fonderoy. Thank you. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye. May I go to see Dearest now? I think she'll be waiting for me. There's something for you to see in the stable first. Ring the bell. In the stable? If you please. I'm very much obliged. But I think I'd better see it tomorrow. She'll be expecting me all the time. Oh, well, you'll order the carriage. And you don't get to see what's in the stable. Oh, I do, I do. Doesn't matter. It's only a pony. Pony? Whose pony is it? Yours. Mine? Yes. Oh, I never thought I'd have a pony. I never thought that. How glad dearest will be. You give me everything, don't you? Wouldn't you like to see it? Of course I want to see it. I want to see it so much I can hardly wait. But I'm afraid there isn't time. You must see your mother this afternoon. You can't put it off till tomorrow? Why, she's been thinking about me all the morning. And I've been thinking about her. Oh, perhaps. I'll, I'll ring the bell. I'm not going to get out. Not... not to see Dearest? Dearest will excuse me. Go and tell her that not even your new pony will keep you away. She'll be disappointed. She'll want to see you very much. I'm afraid not. The carriage will call for you as we come back. Drive on, Jeffrey. his own mother. Cook at Cross Lodge was telling Sarah she'd never have worked for a sweeter lady than Mrs. Errol. The letter was written by the little gentleman his old self, signed with his name to. Fontelroy, 
I love this one. <laughs> the little sweet with eye, that's the mother. This is young thing, too. Good morning. Good morning. God bless you, man. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. His lordship coming to services. That's a new notion. They say even his gout's improving. Look at the young lord. He's Captain Cedric all over again. He's the captain south of a life. How glad the people are to see you. Take off your hat, Father Roy. They're bowing to you. Me? God bless your lordship. Long life to you. Thank you. Yes, I suppose he's come to have a look at his new landlord. Yes, my lord. I understand his young lordship was kind enough to speak for me. And I thought I'd like to say a word of thanks. I've got a great deal to thank your lordship for. Oh, I only wrote the letter. It was my grandfather who did it. You know how good he always is to people. Is Mrs. Higgins well now? Hey, yes, your lordship. The missus is better since the trouble was took off her mind. My grandfather was very sorry about your children having the scarlet fever. You see, Higgins, you people have all been mistaken about me. Lord Bunteroy understands me. If you want a little reliable information on the subject of my character, apply to him. Get in the garage, Bunteroy. Isn't that enough? We used to see each other all the time. 
We could tell each other things without waiting. Well, did you ever forget about her? No, sir, never. I shouldn't forget about you, you know. If I didn't live with you, I should think about you. All the more. But I believe you would. such a good Earl, he reminds me of you. He is a universal favorite. Well, reminds me of you. Think of that now. He's known this Earl only a little while, and we, we was lifetime acquaintances. I don't know as I want him to be reminded of me by this Earl. They've been using influence on him, I bet you. You're right. They got twisty ways, those aristocrats. They'd wheedle their little finger around your heart as soon as look at you. All for their own purposes, mind. It's a pity they're making an oil out of him. Yeah. He would have been a shining light in the grocery business. A shining light. You know any particulars about that stuff, like castles and oils? No, not much. Except they're haughty and mean. Sure is a Jim Dandy letter he wrote. Almost as good as seen. Oh, it ain't it. Oh, he was a plum baby of a kid. I bet you sometimes he wishes he was back here. I do. You lonely? Oh, not so bad. Where are you living now? Oh, me and two other fellas, we got a room in a lodging house. The other two fellas, they get drunk and fight, but it's cheap. Oh, that's no sort of a place for a lad like you to be living. Now, look here. I got a clean, dry loft over my stable, and there's no bed you can have. Why don't you come here and stay? Won't cost you a cent. Gee, you mean that, Mr. Hobbs? Well, certainly I do. Yahoo! Gee, Mr. Hobbs, talking about oils. You ain't no oil. You're a prince. Oh, sure. Whether you will have an American accent. Look, my dear, won't it be interesting if he has the drawing book? I will. Oh. When do we see the mother? Shh. I believe she's supposed to be kept in the background. <laughs> <laughs> well, Molly Newton, this the boy? Yes, Constantia, this is the boy. Come to ride, this is your great aunt, Lady Lauderdale. How do you do, great aunt? How do you do, young man? You're like your father. I loved him more than most people in this wicked world. Oh, did you know my father? Know him, of course, sir. Oh, then you must be dearer. She will enormously like to talk to you about him. You see, I was the only one she could talk about him to who knew him. And I was so small when he Yes, uh, Bondurai, this is your great uncle, Sir Harry Lauderdale. How do you do, sir? Here are your fond of horses. I confess to you, Constantia, that uh, what you'll probably see there's a risk of my becoming rather an old fool about him. Becoming? <laughs> By the way, the mother. What does she think of you? I don't know. I'm not. You must come over to Lauderdale Park one day to see us. There's some uh, new cocker puppies in the kennel. You shall have your pick. Oh, thank you very much indeed, Uncle. Only Dougal might be offended. You see, he's very fond of me, and I really shouldn't like to hurt his feelings. <laughs> Hurt his feelings. That's a good one. You hear that, Connor? Hurt his feelings. <laughs> this is Miss Herbert, Fontenoy. I want you to be great friends with her. How do you do? Have you met Dougal? He shakes hands beautifully. Shakes hands with Miss Herbert, Dougal. <laughs> <laughs> He's a great friend of mine. I like making friends, don't you? Yes, I do. May I be your friend? And Dougal. Oh, yes, if you please. Okay, Lambego, Boris, you. Better, I hope. Thanks. Much better. 
I've known Dorian Court as well as anyone could know him for five and thirty years. And that's the first time he's ever bothered to inquire about my health. Most extraordinary. <laughs> oh, haven't you? You're late. What's the catch? I beg your pardon, my lord. I, I was detained by extraordinary news. You? What? What news? Not now, if you don't mind. Later, my lord. Later. <laughs> When you're older, you'll not have the courage to say that. Nobody could help saying it. Don't you think she's pretty, too? Well, we are not allowed to say what we think. Lord Fauntleroy shall say what he thinks. I'm sure he thinks what he says. I think you're prettier than anyone I ever saw, except dear. I think she is the prettiest person in the world. I'm sure she is. And I must tell her how kind you've been to me. I never was at a party before, and I've enjoyed myself so much. Oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, little Lord Fonderoy. Sleep well. What's the matter? Something serious must have happened to make you behave like this. What is it? It's bad news. The very worst of news, my lord. I'm sorry I have to be the bearer of it. Why do you look at the boy so? You hang over him like a bird of below man. Has it anything to do with Fodleroy? My lord, I waste no words. My news has everything to do with him. If we're to believe it, it's not Lord Fauntleroy who lies asleep before us, but only the son of Captain Errol. The present Lord Fauntleroy is the son of your boy, Bevis, and at this moment is in a lodging house in London. What do you mean? You're mad! It's a lie! An abominable lie! If it's a lie, it's painfully like the truth. A woman came to my chambers this morning and told me that she married your son, Bevis, in London 11 years ago. She showed me the marriage certificate. The child was born shortly after Bevis deserted her and was taken by her to America. Oh, the woman's obviously an imposter. Put your trumped up fraud. I'm afraid not, my lord. I saw the boy's birth certificate. She's, I'm afraid, a very ignorant person. But she's consulted a lawyer who advises her that her son is, of course, Lord Fauntleroy and the rightful heir. She demands that his claim be immediately acknowledged. I'll protest this to the last. I'll disown Bevis' boy. I'll have nothing to do with him or his mother. You can't disown him, my lord. Nothing we can do can keep the eldest son's child from his inheritance. What do you say? He's an ignorant, vulgar person, eh? can hardly spell her own name. She's obviously uneducated and openly mercenary. And I... I objected to his mother. I suppose it's retribution. If anyone had ever told me I could be fond of a child, I wouldn't have believed. 
I always get tested here. I open them all the most. In front of him. Oddly enough, he's fond of me. You know, Havisham, I'm not popular. I never was. But he's fond of me. Never was afraid of me. My place better than I could. He'd have been an honor to the name. You rang, my lord. Take, take Lord Fauntleroy to his room. What a pity. The boy is a thoroughbred if ever there was one. I suppose you may say it's a judgment on Molyneux. That boy. The first human being he ever loved. Will Molyneux take the case to the courts, do you think? Can't tell. He's obstinate enough. The courts of the devil. You go in with your best suit, buckles on your shoes, and come out as nature major. Bless my soul, Constantia. Whoever would have dreamed that I'd have felt sorry for the old boy. I wouldn't have minded our having a boy like that, Harry. Yes. Good luck for us, old girl, if we had. Yes. I'll tell you one thing. If his little lordship loses his title, the village loses the best friend it has. Mm. Aye, that's right. And I'll tell you another thing. It'll drive the Earl mad if this goes wrong for him. Why, he's been so proud of the boy, you'd hardly believe it if you knew him for what he was before. Mm. And the new one's no lady, that's sure. So faced thing, that's what she is. Dark-eyed, brazen-faced wench. This year, I'll come in now with Mr. Albersham. You come in here calling yourself Lady Fauntleroy. I want to see you. Ah, come this way, my lord. This way, my lord. Earl of Darincourt. Pleased to meet you, I'm sure, my lord. Better? Go shake hands with your grandpa. You're going to treat your grandson, is it? Ah, uh, you needn't try to look so fierce about it. He's your grandson, all right. Uh, yes, my lord. We have proof of the young gentleman's birth. He is the son of the late Lord Oxroy. Allow me to introduce myself. Joshua Snade, at your service. My car. Uh, I've already had the pleasure of making Mr. Havisham. Uh, Lady Fauntleroy has placed all the evidence in my hands. I can assure you, my lord, it is sufficient to justify her case should it come into court. Uh, but may I suggest that uh, we uh, come to an arrangement and settle this matter amicably on a friendly basis? Friendly? Huh! Look at him staring at me as though I was dirt. Me, his own daughter-in-law. Oh, your son Bevis married me, all right. And a fine rotter he was. But he was the father of my boy, and I can prove it. Lady Fonterra, please. You may think you can fight me, but a lot of good it'll do you. They don't love you around here, and you know it. I've heard plenty about you and your dirty, snobbish pride. Plenty of pride you'll have when I'm finished with you. Unless you want to climb down off your high horse and get reasonable with your own flesh and blood. Lady Fon Roy, you shut up. Lady. I'll stop at nothing, do you hear? I'll drag this case through every court in the land. I'll let the whole world know what you are. You and your precious son, Bevis, deserting me and his own child, a babe in arms. How I've suffered, heaven only knows. And you standing there looking at me and my boy as if we were scum. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You say you married my eldest son. 
If that's proved to be true, the law's on your side. In that case, your son will be Lord Futteroy, and you will be provided for. But I warn you, the matter will be sifted to the very bottom. I'll only add that I want to see nothing of you or your boy as long as I live. After my death, you can, unfortunately, do as you please. Yes, you're exactly the kind of person that I should have expected my son, Babis, to choose. <laughs> I'm afraid, darling Court, there can be no true opinion. At least that's how I see it. You agree, Semple? Yes, I'm afraid we can see it no other way. But it's, it's monstrous. That woman, that boy, are utterly unfit. Alas, the law can take no cognizance of such things. I sympathize, darling court, more than I can say. Ship, I thought you should <laughs> If we take it to the courts, you think there can be only one result? I'm afraid so. The birth certificate, everything we have, points the same way. If you take it to court, you have the expense, the notoriety, and only, I fear, one possible result. Perhaps the boy won't turn out so badly as you fear. Perhaps you can do something with it. That boy? That? Oh! With the other one. Yes. Uh, uh, I have no other course but to accept your judgment. Come, have a good thing with those. And you, Mr. Simple. People have often said so. I'm glad to think he's like his father, too. Yes, he is. Like my son. Won't you sit down? Thank you. I've come to tell you that I've had the very best, the highest legal opinion. I'm sorry. This outrageous woman and her child Perhaps she cares for him, as much as I care for Seti, my lord. Her son is Lord Fauntleroy. Mine is not. Yes, I'm afraid you're right. Perhaps you would prefer that Seti should not be the Earl of Darling Court. It's a very magnificent thing to be the Earl of Darling Court, my lord. I know that. But all I care about is that Seti should be with his father. Brave, just, and kind, always. A striking contrast to what his grandfather is, eh? I haven't had the pleasure of knowing his grandfather. I know my little boy believes. I know that said he loves you. Would he have loved me if you told him why I didn't receive you at the castle? No. Honestly, I think not. That's why I didn't wish him to know. Very few women who wouldn't have told him. Yes. Said he is fond of me. And I'm fond of him. I can't stay. I was ever fond of anyone before. But he pleased me from the first. I'm an old man. I was tired of my life. But he has come with something to live. More than that. More than that. I am proud of him. I was satisfied to think that one day he'd be taking my place as head of the family. I'm miserable. 
much trouble, you must be tired. And you need all your strength. Perhaps it's because I'm miserable. I've come to you. I used to hate you. I've been jealous of you. This wretched, disgraceful business has changed all that. Now to see him. Pussy woman who. Well, I felt it would be a relief to come to you. An obstinate old fool, I suppose. I know. I treated you badly. But I come to you because the boy cares for you. And because I care for you. Treat me as well as you can. For the boy's sake. Whatever happens, he shall be provided for. Eddie shall be taken care of now and in the future. Always. Thank you. You like the house? Oh, very much. It's a cheerful room. May I come back again and talk this matter over? As often as you wish. I'll take care of that. Then I can still be your boy, even if I'm not going to be the Earl, just like I was before. My boy. Yes, you've been my boy as long as I live. And I do. Sometimes I think you're the only boy I've ever had. Then I don't care about the Earl part at all. I thought, you see, that one that was going to be the Earl had to be your boy. But I couldn't be. I shall never take anything from you that I can hold for you. Come what may, you shall have all that I can give. All. And dearest, will her house be taken away from her? No. They can take nothing from her. Nothing from either of you. The aged Earl remains secluded in his castle and refuses to have any communication with the rightful heir. Ah, oh, we know that stuff. They've been printing that for the past week. Is there anything new about Seti? Yes, here it says, uh, the prospects do not look very bright 
for the false claimant, Cedric Errol of Brooklyn. So I am jiggered. At last, they've succeeded in robbing him out of being an Earl. I thought you was against oil. So I am. Ain't it just like him? Cheating the poor kid out of his rich estates? Now, what's going to become of him? Well, I know one thing. He's done everything in a well for me, and he can always come back here and have half of my shoe shining business. Well, now, I'll tell you, Dick. I'd always had it in my mind that said he would come in with me someday. He'd be a shining light in the grocery business. The new lady Fauntleroy was formerly an actress. She is said to have played in New York and London. Continued on page five. Here's a picture of her. Holy mackerel. Mother. Here, look at this. It's her. Her? She ain't no aristocrat, she ain't. I know her as good as I know you. It's Minna, Ben's wife. Your brother? Sure. You mean it's some kind of hocus pocus? Sure I do. Well, I'm jiggered. She was married before, but I never heard of her having no other kid but Ben's kid. You mean the one Ben went out to Chicago to look for? Sure. Maybe she had another kid in England. And uh, maybe she didn't, maybe she didn't. We ought to do something about this. Dead right we thought. But we got to get the proper advice. Gee, I wish I knew Alderman Murphy. I know Alderman Murphy. You do? Yeah, come along. Let's go right now. Them Earls, they've always had a spite against us Americans ever since the Revolution. What a... What a hole. I'm sick to death of it. Pooped up here. Weak in and weak out with nobody to talk to. You're complimentary. I wasn't meaning to be. And grateful. You're getting your money, aren't you? Business is business, you know. Business. I'm sick of business. I want some fun. Why don't you go up to London for a while? London? <laughs> Not on your tin pipe. Nothing would please that old devil up at the castle better than to see me clear out. Well, I'll stay here, here in this rotten country. Bob, have you lived in worse places in your time, I've no doubt. That's none of your business. You keep a civil tongue in your head or I'll hand you your walking papers. I wouldn't. What do you mean? Just what I said. I wouldn't try anything like that, Minna. I'm Lady Fauntleroy to you. Uh, uh. Come in. Why, it's Lord John. Why, this is a pleasure, a real pleasure, I'm sure. Won't you take it? Hello, Minna. Hi, hello, Dick. Hi, Ben. What are you doing here? Where have you been all this time? You know her? Funny if he didn't, seeing as how he was my second husband. Where is the child? What child? You know what child, our boy Tom. Oh, Ben. But you know, you must have heard. Someone must have told you. Told me what? It was pneumonia. Only three days and he was gone. It broke my heart. I meant to write you, but I didn't know where you were. If that's true, who is this boy you've got with you? That's none of your business, Ben Tipton. Can I see him? No, you can't. But tell us, please, why Mr. Tipton should not see your boy. Oh, good Dick. Well, I'll be jiggered. Oh, Mom, oh, you oh, are up. You're a dirty pair, you are, coming all this way to spy on me, trying to do me hurt. I'll have the law on you for the way you're hounding me. You. Hey, Come here, Tom. I knew nothing of this, my lord, I assure you. There's a little matter of a forged birth certificate. I swear to you. Oh, never mind, Harrisham. I've had enough of this. Too much. The sooner the pair of you are out of this country, the better. Come on, Harrisham. You'll be sorry for this, you will. It's prosecution, that's what it is. It's robbery. Uh
This will be somewhat in the manner of a museum, my lord? Well, no, not exactly a museum, Mr. Hobbs. They're portraits of my ancestors. Your ancestors? All of them? I'll be jiggered. Your great uncle. He must have had a family. Did he raise them all? I mean that they were earlier distinguished members of the family. You know, Earl, I used to have a very poor opinion of you aristocracy. But I've changed. I'll take you, for instance. You're a pretty good sort, even if you are an Earl. I'm very gratified. A bit gay, wasn't he? Yeah. That's why I had the gout, Mr. Hawk. And it was all Earl. Said he's going to be one. And own all this. And he'll be worthy of it, Mr. Hart. Sure he will. All these Earls. You know, I wouldn't have minded being one myself. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's such a lovely day. I always like having birthdays, but never one so much as this because you're all so kind to me. Uh, my grandfather wants everybody to be happy and comfortable, and I'll want it too when I'm grown up. I think that's all because I'm not very good at making speeches, but I must say that I'm very much obliged to you for liking my birthday. Ripping little nipper. Ain't he a daisy? I'll bet you boys elect him king someday. <coughs> I didn't know the little fella could talk so good. Why, he makes a better speech than Alderman Murphy. By Joe. Oh, well, I'll be jiggered. And I've another birthday present for you. Another one besides all the things this morning? Yes, best of them all. Wanting you here, I was wanting you here so terribly much. Were you, darling? Ponderoy, your mother's come to live with us in the castle. To live with us? To live with us for always? Are you sure you really want me? We've always wanted you, if we weren't exactly aware of it. Well, Mr. Hobbs, it's so nice having you here with us. I dread to think of you ever going back to America. Not to live there. Not to live there. America's a good enough country for them that's young and stern. But there's faults in it. There's not an ant sister among them. Star and Earl. Yeah. 